Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com. S T R E N G T H G U I L D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the per- first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and nutrition professor of about 20 years, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens, strength coach, powerlifter, Highland Games athlete, and I'm currently 6,000 swings into Dan John's 10,000 swing challenge. So, Ooh. Um, I'm, on, I'm on the downslope. So... <laughs> Sixty yeah. percent of the way there, I can yep. give you. Yeah. <laughs> I was Dr. Mike T. Nelson, creator of the Flex Diet Cert, faculty member of the Kerrig Institute, and other places. And I have a large freezer in my garage now, full of water to jump into in the morning. So Ooh. it's been fun. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Blakely. I own C. Jake and Jane Train, and I help fit pros become brilliant business people and i'm really happy to be on with you guys today um to help in any way i can perfect everyone we thought michelle would be a a good guest because of her financial expertise and working with coaches and trainers and that sort of thing i mean obviously when we had dan on we you know i talk about dan like he's my brother or something but you know we had dan and he's just sort of sharing a bunch of stuff about how you can train at home but what about making a living you know virtually and that sort of thing i thought we could sort of address that we haven't really done deep dives into this whole public public health crisis, of course, but, you know, it's sort of inevitable. And so, obviously, we're going to bring our strength, uh, strength and sports nutrition slant to everything. Let me start with some mail and news. Uh, we got a mail from Ben, and I just wanted to read this quickly. Hey, guys, I love your show. I've been listening for a couple of years and truly appreciate the info from y'all every episode. I was super thankful to find somebody who geeked out on fitness like I do. Didn't know if you heard the guys on the Stronger by Science podcast, uh, and I thought that might be right up your alley. Anyway, thanks for everything, Ben. So I thought that was nice. Thank you, Ben. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, they're good guys. Usually Eric Trexler, Greg Knuckles is on there, and other people. So yeah, yeah, they also do uh, the mass which is a kind of nice summary of research reviews that's actually well done. They're all highly educated people who lift, too, so good stuff. Helpful, yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay, here is um, some news for everyone, and again, this may set the stage uh, as we sort of transition to uh, asking Michelle for her expertise. Strength and Muscle Sport News. This first one is from labroots.com. Uh, why does COVID-19 kill so many older people? Now, before you get bored and fast forward in the episode, just take note that we're going to bring sort of our own um, commentary to this. But it says, since early statistics began to emerge from China, it, it became pretty apparent, of course, that it affected older people. Or uh, data from Italy is matching the data from China, so it's not just a fluke. Um, my son said he's skeptical of some of the data coming from China because of transparency reasons and that kind of stuff. And I can understand some of that, I guess. Um, Anyway, the Italy data matches that. And it says the uh, average age of those um, that are already dead from the virus is 79.5. So there's a lot of problems when you're very old. It says, according to Sean Lang, a professor of medicine at John Hopkins, uh, Studies over the years have shown that in most people, their immune function is pretty okay in their 60s and even in their 70s, Uh, but it goes down rather quickly after age 75 or 80. 
Now, let me bring our angle to this. Obviously, strength athletes are interested in testosterone or, for example, estrogen and its role in muscle protection or ability to handle larger volumes. I couldn't help when I read this to think, what if one of the things that are leading to the declining immune system is the absence of sex hormones, right? Or the extremely reduced amount of sex hormones. Because we know testosterone changes how immune the immune system works and estrogen too. So in fact, when we talked about gender differences last time, there was some evidence from animal studies that estrogen helps protect people from the COVID-19 virus because mm-hmm. women are much less likely to get uh, as sick uh, as men. So I couldn't help but think maybe there's a, a thing here about the decline in sex hormones in very old people. Um, it says, as the number of white blood cells available to find and eradicate infections declines with age, older people are at a higher risk of having a dangerous immune response called a cytokine storm. Uh, although cytokines are proteins that signal the body to better fight infection, during a storm, the body, of course, makes an excess, which causes severe inflammation. And we know that, of course, respiratory failure is one of the things that actually kills people and they need the ventilators and everything. Um, now, my, again, with the sports nutrition thinking, I, I mentioned this earlier, but this makes me glad. That I feel like my tissues are pretty saturated with omega-3 fats because those have a, a cytokine calming effect. Uh, it's one of the reasons that they help with arthritis patients and that sort of thing. So, you know, I'm not saying everybody go take your omega-3s and you'll be protected, but, you know, it might actually reduce a little bit of the cytokine response like it does in other conditions. Totally speculating. Anyway, um, a weaker immune system also means higher susceptibility to chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart conditions, and cancer. So those further compound the issue, right? I mean, one of the underlying problems with diabetes you might think, well, what does diabetes have to do, because so many people have it, what does it have to do with poor response to the virus? But diabetes, all that blood sugar and that, inf- that sort of inflammatory condition you're always in, that makes it harder for your body to fight infections. So there's a lot of things going on here. Here are some stats from Italy. Uh, 48.5% of people who died had three or more underlying conditions like that. Uh, 25% had at least one underlying condition, and get this, just 0.8, 0.8 of deaths had no underlying illness. So I think that's very interesting. If you're younger, you're more fit, uh, and this brings me to my other topic here. There is something called the leukocytosis of exercise, right? Mike and I have talked about this before, but uh, when you exercise, you flush a lot of the white blood cells, the neutrophils and other things out of your pulmonary vasculature and into your body. And that's really helpful. Regular exercise, so long as you're not overtraining your butt off, um, has a very helpful effect on Im- immune function. So if you guys are stuck at home, and I know uh, most people are, I don't know, do your kettlebell swings like Phil, right? Get that heart rate up, flush your lungs, get that leukocytosis of exercise not only will it strengthen your cardiopulmonary system, but it's actually going to help your immune system. So just some thoughts, you know, from sort of the nutrition and ex perspective. Uh, Mike, any thoughts from you about any of this stuff? Yeah, I agree. Um, my buddy, Dr. Doug, I think posted something about uh, omega-3s looking at a preliminary study. And I don't remember if it was related to COVID-19 or not, but uh, he does a lot of omega-3 uh, testing here. What it says is there's a meta-analysis that looked at the outcomes of getting uh, fish oil with uh, septus uh, related to similar lung pathology as COVID infection. And basically, they found that the fish oil was given post-infection, and it looks like it was beneficial. So they had less time on a ventilator and went out of the ICU earlier than the group that did not receive uh, fish oil. Perfect. Yep, not so. surprising. Yeah, so again, not obviously a super randomized controlled trial on what we're looking at, but, you know, some pretty interesting data that shows it, you know, should be beneficial. And like we've talked about many times before, there's not much of a downside to to fish oil and essential fats at all, really. Right on. Yep. Michelle, what about you? Exercise and nutrition. Are you glad you do certain things right now, given the, you know, crisis? Oh, my gosh. Uh, this so this is a little bit more vanity related, but this whole situation is definitely testing the tensile strength of my skinny jeans um, because I really 
You know, I love I love the working out. Um, I'm so glad I do it. As soon as I heard the initial reports about COVID and who it was affecting um, in terms of if you had other underlying health problems, if you um, were of a certain age, if you were already um, dealing with certain problems, I was so grateful that I've just baked in healthy living into my life and into, you know, my kids um, and what they do. But, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm really, I'm also very grateful that we have habits of healthy eating as well. So we move a lot. I exercise a lot. I lift, obviously, um, just like uh, you guys. And, but I'm also very glad that my kids and I are, habitually eating good foods. We're taking, you know, whatever supplements we believe in. And I'm glad that's not new to us um, yeah. with the new, right? That if you are already at a disadvantage, this disease is um, more threatening to right. you. It's illness. Yeah. Uh, I can't help but think that, like, we know that, you know, more than 70% of Americans are overweight or obese, you know, and they eat processed food and, and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, there's an underlying condition, right? That now some yeah. of our listeners, they might be, they might carry excess body fat if they're like a, a super heavyweight, you know, competitor or something like that. But they're also, they have the right. anti-inflammatory effects of regular training, you know, and that kind of stuff. And hopefully they're eating their vegetables and stuff like that. And they're not living on, you know, fries and burgers but yeah, I can't help but think the average person in the U.S. All, just by nature of living here, they've got at least one underlying condition, right? As opposed to people who, like you say, you know, has has it baked in. They're literally the composition of their tissues are different and less inflamed because they eat vegetables and drink tea and stuff like that. You know, right? So right, and I think that. Sorry, just one more point. You know, when I was walking through the grocery store before this got super serious right before we started most of us started taking this seriously everybody was stocking up on things right and this one woman in the aisle said to a stranger she said COVID-19 is going to kill us we're all going to kill ourselves by overeating which I thought was you know funny and had some truth to it right. but when you looked at the parts everybody was stocking up on all the processed stuff and to some degree I get it because okay that's going to have a longer shelf life but that's the wrong thing to be eating right when you're trying to keep your immune system as healthy and prepared as possible so it's almost like the odds are stacked against a lot of us if you weren't already on board with you know habitual healthy living on a daily basis in small powerful ways right yeah yep uh let me go to one more uh, piece of news that will set the stage even more, especially when we talk about coaches and trainers and how they can survive here. This is from the Institute of Food Technologists. U.S. restaurant industry hit hard by pandemic. The mandated restaurant dine-in closures that took effect across most of the United States beginning the week, of, uh, the week ending March 22nd took a toll on restaurant transactions reports the NPD group. So this group says that total restaurant customer transactions declined by 36%, uh, again, in the week ending March 22nd, compared with the same week a year ago. So a third down. Uh, Chain-specific transactions and share trends for 70 quick service, fast, casual, mid-scale, and casual dining chains were included. The quick service restaurants, which represent the bulk of the restaurant industry, uh, have more off-premise business than full-service restaurants. They decreased by 34% uh, in that week compared to a year ago. The full-service restaurants, which are, of course are very reliant on dine-in sales, they had sales drop by 71% compared to a year ago. Mm -hmm. That's not that surprising, of course, when <laughs> the governor says, get out, right? So um, nobody in the restaurants. Uh, quote, it's highly probable that this crisis will define winners and losers by their digital proficiency, since consumers yeah. may prefer the contactless delivery protocol that digital ordering offers, said David 
report to Latin NPD food industry advisor. Uh, additionally, a, a National Restaurant Association survey, NRA survey, of 5,000 U.S. operators found that 44% have temporarily closed their restaurants and 11% say they're permanently closing within 30 days. So they're, oh. they're just done. Um, as the yeah. coronavirus epidemic rages on, 3% of restaurant operators have already permanently closed. Uh, and then one last little tidbit here. This is grim, I know. During the first 22 days of March, uh, the restaurant industry lost $25 billion and 3 million jobs. So obviously the food industry, I'm, I'm being a nutritionist, I'm interested in this stuff, and they are getting hammered. And I've got to think that, you know, again, people that are heavily reliant on face-to-face -face and they don't have much digital proficiency, as they point out here, it could actually separate the winners from the losers. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, in fact, let's let's go to break early, and then we come back. Let's just talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, people who are trainers and coaches, and if they're if they're face to face people, what are they doing? So, yeah. uh, we'll be back. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you know who this is. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, new book, uh, Why You Should Eat Keto. I don't do it because, I mean, look at me. Come on, I'm fabulous and I'm fantastic. Anyway, you should text uh, Keto ebook all in one word to 44222 to receive your free copy. Do it, do it now. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what, uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry and what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's an enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit uh, royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. <laughs> Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> All right, folks, we're back. It's Mike and Phil and Lonnie, and we have Michelle Blakely with us to try to help with some of this grim stuff that we were just talking about before the break. Um, 
Michelle, do you agree with that uh, that um, statement? I'm guessing you probably do about how digital proficiency is going to help decide winners and losers in who survives business wise. I absolutely agree with that. And to always keep a thread of hope there, right? I'm someone who always believes there are solutions. There's always an ability to solve a problem. If you're not digitally proficient now, you can learn quickly if you're open. My, my biggest concerns are for the fitness professionals and, you know, in-person uh, strengths or powerlifting or coaching people that are not tech savvy or proficient and get stuck or frozen and don't realize they have the capacity to learn these tools and learn them quite quickly so that they can get on board and not miss the boat. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Phil, I know you're operating like the library of muscle checking out equipment and, <laughs> and, and you're doing the, um, you know, like the kettlebell challenge stuff. Are you doing videos of all that? What are you doing digitally? Well, aside from just, you know, I, I program them. And basically the only thing I do digitally is a bounce back and forth between clients digitally. So they send me, I send them. Like, no, do it this way uh, type of thing. So mm -hmm. looking at videos and doing, a, you know, checking form and things like that oh, okay. is where we're at. So. Our, but that's pretty that's pretty usual for me. I've done that. But I, nothing's changed. <laughs> so I'm just doing it more. <laughs> I'm doing it more now than I was. Oh, before. okay, right, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, do you find that the your clients are they easily just naturally because of phones and guess I, and whatnot? I guess it wouldn't be a problem. They can upload the videos and you can actually see them well enough to give them tips oh, and yeah. stuff like that. I yeah, mean, they they know you know what angles I want and things like that. And if they do one wrong, I just say, hey, do that again and shoot it again, um, okay. type of thing. Yeah. But uh, no, the only thing I'm running into right now is just people being bored of not having the community. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we all talk on Facebook and we have groups and where we can chat. But still, when you're when you're used to training in my facility, where, <laughs> which Lonnie, you've been there, yep. you know it's an atmosphere. Oh yeah. yeah. And now you're stuck at home by yourself. Yeah, you know, it's it's different. It's just never going to be the same. But uh, yes. So, but we try and keep it up as best as we can. We all support each other. You know, like I said, via online groups and chats and you know group text messages. Like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, I do this. You know, we all kind of stay in touch that way. But right on. That's, yeah. That's the best we can do right now. So, well, and I mean. <laughs> We got Iron Radio. I mean, that's something yeah, exactly. community-wise, you know. Um. Phil, have you, or even, you know, Lonnie or Mike, Phil, have you tried um, a Zoom meeting? I use that for other things, not with my clients, but yeah. So, well, one thing that's going on, so um, I came out kind of with the first, first wave for all of my, so my clients for Iron Radio listeners are, you know, personal trainers or coaches or studio owners or small business owners, right? So those are those are my people. So my clients, I pushed hard right away. No, this is not a two week staycation. Mm -hmm. You have got to transition your whole community virtually now. I gave them, you know, suggestions and things, and many of them are very glad they did. Right now, the the uh, the data we're getting is an eighty to one hundred percent conversion mm -hmm. that they brought they brought them over. But um, one of the things I'm working on for kind of the second wave is exactly what you're saying, Phil. How can we continue and foster that connection and sense of community? Because it's so much of what they love about coming into your gym and working with you mm -hmm. and all that. And it's it sounds silly, but I've done it now with a couple different groups, and I'm really endorsing it and recommending it. That you do like a, a virtual cocktail hour. Maybe you wouldn't do cocktails, but, you know. Uh. Some kind of virtual, you know, 7 to 7.45 where everybody learns how to do a gallery view and you can just, you can just talk and see each other's faces and yeah. laugh and, yeah. you know, that might be something that having yeah. some strong community initially, your people might really love and get on board with. Yeah. Because it's different, right? It's different mm -hmm. than text threads are great and. Facebook group posting is great. All those are great. But this is more, this is real time. Yeah. And we're getting to see one another's faces, which is very comforting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could see how that could that motivate you. 
yeah. yeah, get an extra lift. Like if if Phil people from your yeah. your crew like somebody's like I'm gonna try a some odd new PR. You know, maybe it's yeah. not just a uh, one rep max kind of thing, but you got yeah. a couple of people like on on your computer screen being like, "Come on, wuss!" You know, oh, <laughs> love it, love it. Yeah. Not the wuss part, but love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be great. You could do a whole thing. You could have it be, um, you know, your ch- you guys could come up with a cooler name for it. But yeah. you know, your cheering section, or you know, let us know when you're going to go for your next PR, and we'll see how many people from the community can jump off of work and you know get on for that ten minutes. And oh, that'd be brilliant. You can auto record it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, Mike, you're you're so digital to begin with. Uh, yeah. do you have tips for people if someone, I mean, a lot of your clients are coached and trainers, is that correct? I mean, what are you telling them? Yeah. I mean, most of my clients are probably 60, 70% are other trainers and coaches. Um, a lot of them are either hybrid or kind of work online. You know, some of them work for other companies too. So their stuff hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, the people that were doing kind of the hybrid thing, they just converted them over, you know, now digitally for the most part, I guess. Um, So for what I've been doing, it hasn't changed a lot per se from the outside of just the mechanics because, like, I do all their training, I do their nutrition, I do their lifestyle, HRV, sleep, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, like we talked about last time, the biggest thing that's changed is just reworking programs and then people were able to kind of scavenge up a couple dumbbells from, you know, somewhere else. You're kind of rewriting stuff again which is totally fine and just higher levels of stress and people getting used to different routines and you know one person in particular their uh, wife is now at home which is good because they can watch the kids part of the time too but now you've got more people in the house running around bumping into each other and trying to work from home at the same time and (laughs) so just different more it's like anything I think a lot of it is almost logistics too like even if you look at working with higher level athletes like a lot of what you do which is not glamorous but is super important is just literally logistics like where are you going how do you get there what kind of food do you have when you get there how do you get the food do you have a car you know (laughs) like the the stuff people don't think about a lot of times now we're kind of running all of those things too so yeah yep and if i could just jump on that for a second and i see that's where the opportunities are for anyone that is using training or coaching as part of their livelihood that I know a lot of people are, you know, I see a wide range of, you know, from paranoia to denial about. Oh yeah. And yeah, my prediction, both as fitness professionals and and strength conditioning professionals and as the, you know, general population, I don't see this thing ending for and I you know I'm reading all the reports and listening six weeks to six months and I'm keeping abreast of that because that's informing the advice I'm giving my you know business owners um, so you know really thinking about all the solutions you can provide to your communities and to your clients if you have them if this is your livelihood one is very important for both of you but also is a huge opportunity to ethically and powerfully help some people. Like if you just think about what we know about nutrition, about a healthy body, about the benefits of exercise in terms of stress relief and, um, you know, better sleep and all those things, we are what many people need right now. And I completely agree with you, Mike. Some of those elements are how to fit it in and how to navigate the new normal. And so as a message of hope, I think that we in the fitness and strength space should remember we have knowledge that would greatly benefit so many people that are, you know, hurting and really trying to figure out their new normal. Yeah. Yeah. The the comment about people underfoot in different circumstances at home. I mean, not only do you not have the, you know, the distant clang of iron in the background and the heavy metal blasting throughout the whole building, you know, like I'm used to, but 
I, I'm down here squatting in my cat. I feel something weird as I, I'm in I'm in the hole, right? <laughs> and it's my cat <laughs> between my legs. I'm like, you have no fear. You, you have no fear, honey. Get out of here. <laughs> yes, with big confidence, you'd make the rep. Uh, right. I, yeah, I have to tell my clients, hmm. I'm super professional and strict and whatnot, but I have to tell my clients now, like, you know, just heads up, single working mom. Like, there may be a guest appearance. Mm-hmm. You know, by right. an eight or eleven year old girl who thinks the new iPads, the new Minecraft skins app, is far more important than mommy's coaching call. Right. So that you know yes. may need to be addressed at that moment. And everyone, in my experience, I'd love to hear about you guys, has been very understanding and lovely and cool about it. Right. Yeah. You know, even the professional networks, a lot of like the night shows and stuff, everybody's, of course, broadcasting from home. I've just been stricken by how real everything looks like they're not they didn't convert some, you know, studio, bring half the studio home or whatever. This just I mean, the bandwidth is kind of bad. You know, it's it's (laughs) breaking up and and they have a very realistic middle class looking house behind them, you know, and stuff. And it just seems so real. It's almost refreshing. You know, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the truth of all this. Uh, let me ask you this, Michelle. So, I mean, y- you and Phil had mentioned Zoom. Uh, in fact, as a teacher, I'm telling you, I- I'm doing a lot of stuff, both synchronous and asynchronous, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things we all need to think about is how much stuff do you do live and then how much stuff do you let people access when they're ready, you know, when they do after they do play with the kids or take the cat away <laughs> from the room or yep. whatever. Yeah. Uh, so synchronous and asynchronous stuff. I haven't been using Zoom. I've got some other tools that I, I use, but similar stuff. But so what specific action items, uh, if we just get to di- down to some gold nuggets uh, yeah. that that you might suggest to people, like actionable things? I mean, I got to imagine there's some o- other, uh, Michelle, you alluded to this maybe, but uh, new markets, new populations you might be able to help. I mean, what about the introvert who doesn't like to go to the metal blaring, banging gym, you know, and that kind of stuff? I mean, from marketing to, I don't know, what tools are out there? What can people can go look at, you know? Yeah. So I think, you know, um, and I'm just going to say this, this is, you know, it's free, it's open to everyone. So when this first launched, I started doing uh, virtual training and, I make the distinction between virtual training and online. Virtual is real time, in person, Skype, Zoom, Google Hangouts, FaceTime. Yep, right? synchronous. You're yeah. in your cleared free 10 by 10 space, living room. I'm in my basement, beautifully laid out with weights and whatnot, and I'm training you for 30 minutes. We say goodbye. That's it. Online training is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, more what Phil and Mike were referring to where you're sending digital programming, possibly with recorded video, back and forth between one another, but it's not real time. Mm-hmm. So I've been, I when this first came out, I was very worried for so many of the fit pros I knew because I knew many were paycheck to paycheck. I knew their only revenue stream was real time in-person training. And so I started launching a complimentary webinar uh, to show them how to virtually train. Because online training was pretty popular, virtual training um, was not. And I had gotten into virtual training by uh, like seven years ago. I had a client, she was really frail, she had osteopenia in her late 20s. So we knew strength training was the way to help with those bone density losses, and we actually had Great, great progress, significant results. Her physician was super impressed. But then she had to leave the state. So we started, I, you know, started virtual training in a really organic way and have learned a lot. Anyway, I'm having another one on Wednesday night. Lonnie, if anybody wants to join in, it's free. They can just learn the trip, the tips. But what you were asking were what nuggets, right? What should they do? So of your existing community right now, if you train or coach clients, my recommendation is to immediately move to transition them over. Um, some of the industry leaders I'm listening to, the better you keep your connection, the better you keep communication with your people, with your communities, the more likely you are going to survive this. So I want that transition to be quick, but I want it to be 
ethical, professional, and thoughtful. So think through how you're going to do it. Join the webinar I'm going to have on Wednesday. I lay it all out. You know, you can have it. Happy to help. And then, um, you know, do it well. Like, keep your standards what they were. A lot of you hit on it, right? It's really refreshing that we're seeing our colleagues or leaders or what have you, you know, with less makeup and, the, you know, mm -hmm. my Ikea picture frame in the background, and, you know, everybody asks about and, you know, whatnot. Um, that's great, but that doesn't, that should not translate to our standards as trainers, you know, how we show up, how we're dressed, how we're prepared, um, our timeliness, things like that. Yeah. Um, and then I think they really, you have to practice. I know this is, it seems so uh, simple, but it's probably the best thing you can do for yourself. Um, and that's also what I was saying with, if you don't feel you're very tech savvy right now, it's okay. Like just get in there, start playing around with it and figure out what you can do. Ask friends who know better. I mean, send me an email. Like I'm happy to hear from anybody um, to figure the ins and outs of how to position, how to have your Wi-Fi, definitely use Bluetooth, um, you know, air, earbuds for sound quality, what to do when your connection is poor, you know, things, things of that nature um, are, I think, going to be the nuggets that help. And the other is, you know, financial, definitely um, value your services, right? Extend that complimentary first-time session because people aren't going to buy what they don't understand, right? And even if that's, if you're doing something like, you know, Phil and Mike, if now you're transitioning to doing more online programming for your clients, if they've never seen it before, if they don't know what it is, you know, do some kind of extension where you let them see it and experience it before they buy it, because no one's going to buy anything they don't understand. But once they understand how great it is, then I want you to keep, um, a strong sense of knowing your worth, right? I have a lot of trainers who say to me, oh, but, you know, oh, my God, everyone's just throwing out all this free content. Yes, you know, my kind of maybe flippant comment back to that is, but we had 125,000 pages of free workouts on Google before. Now we have 500,000 pages. Like, there was always free content before. The reason your people are going to transition into working with you virtually or online is because it's you. Yes. And you know their body. Phil alluded to this. He knows he can watch a client do a kettlebell swing that he's been training for five years over, you know, their laptop camera and see they're shifting their weight the wrong way and give them that cue because he knows their body already. So we have a huge advantage with the clients we already know in moving to things digitally because um, we know their tendencies and things like that. So th those would be the nuggets. I mean, I've probably got a hundred more, but if I make myself stop talking, those are the, those are the nuggets I would suggest right now. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, we had, I got, it was ages ago, but um, Phil and Mike and I were talking about like, uh, what line do you draw for between free and and not free. And I mean, the ethical way to do that, at least the way we've kind of done that is we provide lots of news, facts, opinions, discussion, yep. but, but, yeah. but we don't, and we've all had this 1 million times, everybody on this call, Hey bro, can you put me on a diet and workout program? And it's like, yeah. now you're asking for individualized attention, which takes right. an enormous amount of assessment and programming. Yeah. So the answer to that is, well, I'm going to I'm going to refer you to Microfill because the answer for me is just no. <laughs> and from them it might be okay, let's let's start the assessment process, right? Because it's individualized, you know, kind of thing. Um, and that and that brings up a great great point. I definitely I have a whole um, and we are we are side note, we are selling something right now, Revenue Rescue Kit for Fit Pros. If you want to buy it, great, buy it. If you have questions, you know, you can email me. But that is something that we're really encouraging them to do is, you know, be cognizant of um, your professional and legal responsibilities, right? Make sure you have a waiver. Make sure you're assessing the client. Make sure you're, you're still being the consummate professional when you're, when you're helping others. And 
consumers should be aware of that, right? Like how, how professional is this person that I'm getting the advice from? Yes, right. Yeah, the liability thing and the waivers and stuff, very important stuff, right? Especially because you're, you're not physically there. Um, I, I think it's good advice to think about the individualized attention versus not because with everybody, well, so many people losing their jobs, right? Yeah. Uh, and not having the funds, uh, offering what you can free. Like that's why this podcast is sort of public radio format. You know, if people, right. we're going to do it regardless. But yeah, I mean, there's that reality. There's that fine line between helping people and giving back and maintaining a sense of community and on the other side not not spending enormous amounts of time where your ROI is so bad that you know you can't give enormous amounts of individualized attention to any one person right uh, I, I get it times are, are are tough right now but um, that's where also you can uh, I, I'd encourage trainers to be you know creative in that well where this is a new normal Right. And whether you think it's going to be, you know, quarantine status for six weeks or six months, six weeks is a long time. Like, what are people struggling with? How could you help? And, you know, are there ways you could do it that are very scalable that you could charge very little for? But that isn't an overextension of your boundaries or your time investment, but um, that a lot of your, you know, clients or community that are more hard hit could still afford and could still get, you know, your valuable advice and you could still maintain that connection. Yep. Can you give me an example and the listeners of what you mean by scalable? Do you mean like package type oh, things sure. where they can pick and no. choose or? No, no. Uh, so what I mean by scale. So I, um, I used to think I was tech competent. I'm very aware I am tech savvy, <laughs> savvy now being thrown into this whole new world. Um, scalable uh, means that, uh, so let's say I write, I have, you know, immune boosting favorite recipes newsletter. And not only does it give them a video of me cooking it in my kitchen, but it shows them the grocery list items they need exactly, rough costs, and time it takes to cook and prep, right? Maybe I create seven newsletters like that, one that launches, you know, every three days. And it took me 15 hours to create it, right? But if I sell it for $7 to my, you know, 50 former group X clients or my 50 former coaching families or what have you, right? That 50 times $7 is a lot of money and there's no end to how many times I could repurpose it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by scalable. It often falls into items that are digital. Right. Yep. That makes sense to me. One of the, one of my critiques, I, I sometimes I've said, and I mean, Mike can really echo this. When you go to a big, like big food and big pharma, why is there so much money at those conferences? Why are there so many freebies and buffets? Yeah. And because it's scalable food, food products are scalable. A cup of coffee oh, is yeah. two bucks, but when you sell a million, that's 2 million bucks. And that, to, and then I go to exercise science conferences, right? At least the traditional ones. And everything is on a much lower scale because it's not as scalable when you're talking about individual or small group training, right? So it's almost like there's this, well, not almost, there's this um, new opportunity where you could create digital products that are more scalable because they are products and they're not real time one-on-one -on, -one on that kind of way. So, and my and my advice there actually is I think the people that can figure out when it's appropriate and when it's not are the ones that are going to succeed. I also think the people that are going to marry the two together are the ones that are going to succeed. So if you can marry something scalable with that touch point, with that connection to you because that's what they love, that's going to take you further than um, something that – right, is, is solely digital, in my opinion. And yeah. I also think we should only try to make uh, the right things scalable. Yeah. So yeah. things aren't, right? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, my bias, that's why I did the, uh, not shameless self-promotion, but the, the Flex Diet certification for nutrition and recovery for education of fitness professionals was trying to get better information out there, having a lot of expert interviews in there. And then so far to date, I've kind of done it in sort of limited release here and there, because if anyone has any questions, I just want them to personally email me anything, you know, so they get interaction with me to make sure that the questions get answered. I can kind of maintain the quality of it because until I get enough people that have gone through it to answer their questions, I'm not sure if I want to have a huge forum with everybody and their brother chiming in on everything, (laughs) but trying to, you know, they get access to the person who came up with it if they get questions or get stuck to. Yep, right on. What is that called again, Mike? Uh, It's the Flex Diet Certification. Let me drill down a little bit here on the the marketing side. I mean, so I'm I'm pretty introverted, and I'm not having much of a problem staying home, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, <laughs> all week long, I've been at the mic. Dream, deli- I'm, I'm, you know, lectures, PowerPoint, and then here I'm podcasting. So, I mean, you know, okay. <laughs> but I got to think there are some marketing opportunities to reach the people that they don't have a lot of uh, – like maybe it's – maybe it is introversion, but maybe it's a, a lack of – confidence or a, a skill set issue where they're not going to walk into a gym they're kind of you know frightened and they could use some training wheels do you see marketing opportunities here and if so how do you market to these other people i mean given the fact that you know i i'm I, assuming they're online are there tools out there mike you you do use um newsletters right is that your main tool or or not main yeah, so the main tool I do is a newsletter. So I try to drive most people to that. I mean, a couple of quick reasons are I only want to talk to people that are kind of interested. So I want there to be a little bit of a barrier. Obviously, I do a lot of free stuff too that's just open to the public. But you know, you kind of have to find it and you have to put your email address in there in order to get more information. And then the other part is I can control all of the conversation and distribution. So I don't have to rely on an algorithm from Facebook or YouTube yes, or right. my ad account on Facebook getting shut down, which happened because I sponsored an article I wrote about CBD and oh. <laughs> you know all the stuff that happens. Yeah. Uh, so that's my bias, and I view that similar to like you know podcasts and stuff as you know for the most part some of it's marketing, but you know ninety percent of it's all content based, and I spend a lot of time writing for it too. You know, so if you want free information that's good, hey, here you go. Here's your free information. And you'll have options, you know, to purchase stuff or to do other things from time to time. Um, but it's it's kind of like you were talking about how, what's the line between free versus paid. So that gives me a way of, you know, the newsletter is more soft teaching and free. The products are much more hard teaching and, and paid, right? So if you want to know exactly what to do, yeah, I want you to have a little bit of skin in the game. I want you to, to you know, actually be a little bit committed, and that means you're probably going to have to pay some money. Uh, if you don't, then cool. Just hang out on the newsletter, get some information for free, and do what you can with it. Dude, that's awesome, too. Yeah. yeah. It's a good point about human behavior. If there's no skin in the game, if there's no money at all, right. then maybe you don't value I, it. You know. Um, I, I completely agree with everything you just said, Mike, and I completely agree with your last point. I think that's some of, some of what I do is help trainers understand, you know, I know you want to help and I know you want to give people things, but we don't always value what we don't earn. We don't value, you could, there's tons of metaphors on that, right? We don't always value what we're not paying for. And so it's not just about your company or you as a practitioner making money. It's about that buy-in and that commitment, right? If I bought a $200 or $2,000 course from Mike, and I'm on the fence about watching the next Netflix episode or doing my homework, yeah. I'm going to, you know, I might be more likely to do the homework because I'm like, oh, yeah, I said I wanted to get this, you know, flex diet certification. So, right. Gonna yeah. it. um, it, it's all it's all very important in of considerations right now for people because you want to be effective and you're not helping those people that are hurting if they're not using the high quality advice or content you're giving them. For me, it took me years to learn because yes. I initially tested it out where I thought, 
years ago when I started, I'm like, oh man, if I give the most hyper specific information, I'm writing a whole program, I'm putting all this effort into them, I'm going to give this to my newsletter list, this is going to be amazing. And all I got was like tons of questions, which is yep. fine. So then I'd follow up with the people and I'm like, all right, so you, we, we'd subbed out your squat, we changed this, we changed that, we changed this. Like, how did the program go? Like, I want to know, like, like, what did you, what happened? How did it go? Oh yeah, you know, I just got real busy. I never got around to doing it. Yep. What I found was like nobody did anything because there was no skin in the game. They were kind of committed, but but not. Or and you know, Phil and Lonnie know this too. If you have students who are paying for lots of money, they show up to class. If you have someone who's paying for a gym membership, they're probably going to show up. They have a sense of community. They've kind of voted with their dollar and say, "Yep, this is important to me." I'm going to do it and then, you know, follow through is much better. So once I realized that, it was like, oh, ah, differentiating this makes makes more sense. Yeah. You know, accountability. You could be accountable to your investment. Uh, and yeah. one of the things I like about also about this idea of doing something live and synchronous is then you're socially accountable. I mean, there's different ways to make, yes. make a client accountable. And I mean, what we do with the podcast is completely like in academics. We always talk about how do you deliver your class? Is it synchronous or asynchronous? And and um, the synchronous stuff might sound great, but you you can overdo it, right? Because people are like, no, that's when I'm, I'm, um, you know, I got childcare issues, or that doesn't fit my schedule, or or whatever. Even even when they sign up for a class, like when we converted everything over to online. I do a lot of stuff podcast style because it's asynchronous, even though I know that those kids right now are free in certain time blocks because I was yeah. teaching them live at that time. It's amazing that you don't get everybody show up in a live time block. And yet doing some of that, like like to Michelle's point, having some balance of what's live in real time and synchronous, that's a good idea from an accountability point of view too. I can imagine that being helpful with a – a club environment like Phil's got, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, you know, I better show up because Phil and the other people are going to kick my ass if I don't log in right now. <laughs> I guess. Plus there may be donuts. Yeah, there you go. Virtual donuts. <laughs> Virtual donuts. <laughs> Virtual donuts now. Get a 3D printer. We'll print them. Yeah. Quick question. Um, is – so if we have the community is going pretty good, a lot of people have made kind of the transition to online or were online before. And let's just assume that that's all going pretty good as best that it can. Is there something with this particular time period that fitness professionals should be more, I guess, focused on since they, they literally do have more time now because a lot of them were training people at the gym and they're probably running virtual sessions and they're doing online. So they're doing stuff. But I'm guessing they probably have more time now than what they did in the past. Is there something they should be focused on for the next few weeks to a few months? Uh, absolutely. My so my clients that have transitioned and gotten you know their heads above water. They've moved eighty to one hundred percent of their clients over, so that they're still delivering good services and they're still you know have the revenue streams coming in. The next two things I think everyone look at are what solutions do your clients need next, right? Because this is the new normal. And you guys actually were just hitting on a good one. Like schedule is really important. Like some people, it's just a free for all in their homes right now and they need to get back to that schedule. So they need us, but what other solutions can you help them with, right? In this quarantine environment and things like that. How can you improve the services, the virtual training? Do you take it outside? Do you do different things like that? But then the next um, item that I would recommend everyone's looking at is working on your business. So now you have more time. You're not commuting. You've got everything flowing. You're still connected to your clients. I would advise you tighten up how well you're running your business, right? Double check you have all the legal and accounting practices in place. See if you shouldn't be restructuring um, your billing and your offerings. Clean up your website if that's what you're supposed to be doing. Hire that business coach um, to help you plan out your recovery for when we come out of quarantine. Those would be my two. Look at what other solutions you can solve for your clients and then work on your business, which a lot of us don't do because we're working these long days with our clients but now that it's a new normal, it's a 
perfect opportunity to kind of clean up the back end, you know, of what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I love what you said about the commute. Like, I I have a long commute. So that's two yep. hours a day. That's 10 freaking hours a week that I can either yes. bi- I can binge Amazon or Netflix or I can do something to self-improve. Yeah. You know. All day. Or split it. Or five hours of Amazon and five hours of working up. <laughs> right. No, that's right. A little recovery maybe yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe um, I'm just projecting with, you know, all this time with my beautiful humans. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time, so um, how can listeners find you if they want to get some more stuff? Because you know, I I I look at you like the business expert you are with marketing and, on, and the online stuff. You're pretty savvy. How can people find you? <laughs> Thanks, Lonnie. I'd love to hear from anyone. Again, I'm Michelle Blakely. The company site is C Jake and Jane Train. So that's S E E J A K E A N D J A N E T R A I N dot com. C Jake and Jane Train. Um, email me, Michelle at C Jake and Jane Train dot com. And then again, this Wednesday evening, I believe it's April 8th, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, you could go to our different social media channels. We have a registration page set up. Everyone is welcome. We're going to talk you through how to do virtual training and do it well and ethically and thoughtfully. Um, and then also just a quick shameless plug. We do have a product right now for fit pros. It's only $197. It's the revenue rescue kit. Um, we'd love for you to buy it. Email me if you have questions about that. And that's on our page. Oh, revenue rescue kit. I like it. It sounds like a service, like a public service almost right now. Right. For, yeah. For so we think, so it's worth five times what we're selling it for. Um, so this was a tough, you know, so it's it's very mission driven because I know the ins and outs of so many of these fit pros and I know they're either super frightened or they don't have quality advice. And I see a lot of, unfortunately, stuff going on out there that's a little bit predatory. So we really created something well and beautiful and underpriced it intentionally because we just want to get it into their hands and get them to... Uh, have the tools they need to stay afloat. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us. Mm-hmm. Thank, yeah, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Love talking to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, everybody, we're gonna we're here. <laughs> so we'll yep. see we'll see you again uh, next week. So thanks for joining mm-hmm. us. Thanks a lot, guys. See you guys. Bye bye. Bye. Hey listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store. One for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry. And they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store. Uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, The stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, Please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org store. Uh, We also are accepting 
supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.